this is this is what's so great about life. Someone says to you, oh, have you been to the place next door? It's like, well, no, I haven't because I don't live there. So whenever I go, I go to R&O's. I'm not going there to go to the place next door. And now I'm like, check out the place next door. Welcome to Story and Craft. Now, here's your host, Mark Preston. Hey, how you doing? Welcome back. Another episode of Story and Craft. Uh, hey, if this is your first episode, welcome. My name is Mark Preston. Preston, and today, uh, a great episode with a very intriguing guy. He is a chef. He is a James Beard and Emmy Award-winning television host. Uh, He's a world traveler. Uh, You've seen him in Bizarre Foods, The Zimmern List, What's Eating America. Uh, Andrew Zimmern uh, is our guest today. Really great chat. We cover a lot of ground about his career, his early life. Uh, He has a great story uh, about kind of overcoming some adversity and uh, finding a way to create something really special uh, in his personal and professional life. Always love those good stories. Uh, Now, of course, uh, we also chatted a little bit about Anthony Bourdain, uh, his relationship, his friendship, and kind of a friendly uh, competition he had with Anthony. Of course, if you listen to the show, you know, love some Anthony Bourdain. It's going to be a great episode with Andrew. Uh, If you are hungry, I suggest getting a snack. I did this show without having a bite to eat for lunch, and I was so hungry when I was done. Just talked a lot about food. Uh, Now, don't forget, if you would, please uh, subscribe uh, to the show. Like the show on your favorite podcast app. That way you don't miss uh, a notification uh, whenever we have a new episode come out. So make sure to do that and leave a little review if you would. Apple Podcasts or whatever app that you use. All right, let's get after it. Today, it is Andrew Zimmern Day right here on Story and Craft. What are we eating today? It's a grilled cheese sandwich. <laughs> it's always it's always the uh, the comfort foods or whatever whatever have you. Nothing that I like better, and I eat it at work, so I can hide my shame from my family. <laughs> I, I work from home, so it's kind of like I have a hard time doing that. Although mm. I, I'm I'm very proud of myself. I was um, in Jamaica with my kids a few weeks ago, and I I don't I don't know how I forgot I had bought a bag of that Blue Mountain coffee. Sure. And I was in my I was in my pantry. I was like. I've been making my regular coffee. I said, wait a minute. This, you ever have one of those days like, oh, today's going to be a good day. I found the good coffee. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I'm all proud of myself here. So you're, uh, are you in, in the Twin Cities right now or are you in New York? I sure am. No, I'm in the Twin Cities. How often are you uh, in Minnesota? Well, it depends. Uh, as bad as 100 days a year, as good as most of the year. I tell you, it's so funny. If it wasn't for you, uh, now I've had friends that lived in Minneapolis. Uh, I know he lived in St. Paul. Um, I would have never learned about lutefisk, or the, was it hot dish? The, mm-hmm. I, I've never known about these culinary uh, treasures of Minnesota. But one for awful, you. one awful, and one superb. One of the things I always admired is is how somebody can travel as much as you do, and maintain a sense of sanity. I love traveling, but after about a week, I'm like, you know, I'm kind of looking for my own bed here after uh, after a while. Yeah, big time, big time. Real quick, just gonna touch on a little origin story kind of the inception when you started working with the scripts networks the uh was it travel channel or was it food network that you first kind of debuted your show on travel channel uh and yeah it was uh it was scripts and uh, what was discovery then it was uh went out on its own then it was cox then it was uh back to discovery again so i've been one way or another, uh, taking a check from the same people for a long time. <laughs> yeah. I've had I've had shows on Food Network, but it, it, it's mainly Travel Channel. What I'm fascinated by is by how, depending on the era where we may see any name any one of your shows, maybe on food or maybe on uh, like Magnolia now, you know. So, but uh, but the thing is that the shows are out there, and I, I think you do such a, a wonderful job. And of course, that's just not kissing up right now more than kind of any other time, at least in American culture. I think having those shows that kind of show you we're more alike than than different, I think, are kind of important in my mind. More important than ever. I don't know I don't know how many minds we're changing. Um I hope it's many. Uh but uh yeah, it's uh it's real important for uh I think for everyone to see. You have a son, correct? I do. You, you just have the one son. How old is he now? I'm going to ballpark. Seventeen and a half. And anybody that's listening to this knows is like, of course, I'm a fan. You know, I remember one episode. I think you were in Africa. I think it was Africa. You, your wife was on uh, on the trip with you, and I remember there yes. was a rite of passage for a young child, 
And I remember you were tearing up a little bit because it was correlating between his bris or his, his or the kind of, I think uh, there was some kind it was of a, a rite ritual, of passage it, that you were It was a ritual and, circumcision. The, the, the difficulty f- uh, for me was that it was done when the uh, young boy was five, which is different than uh, uh, oh, several yeah, days well, old. Uh, as is typical here in this country, but but more importantly, the the plan was for the most honored guest to um, consume the foreskin. Now, this is typically in the Sakalava tribe, believed to be the paternal. Was it the grandfather? The paternal, Wasn't the grandfather uh, supposed to be the grandfather? One? Yeah, and uh, he. Act, we, you know, he wanted to uh, step aside and allow me because he felt I was, I, I had been in the village with them for five or six days and he wanted me to take his place. And I was extremely nervous as the, because the, as this circumcision is going on, I know that in a matter of minutes, I'm consuming uh, human foreskin. And, uh, you know, it, it's, sitting there, so many thoughts are going through my mind. Um, I want to be a good guest, but is this a bridge too far, as they say? And uh, at the moment I, you know, I got up, the maternal grandfather insulted that he was relegated to third banana instead of second banana, because he believed if paternal oh. grandfather issues said foreskin, he should... And he grabs it out of someone's hand and throws it in his mouth and like so there and and stomps out and that was it. Yeah, I re- I remember something went went not as planned, not to plan, but I thought it was so endearing because I think I think in your VO on it you were you were correlating or maybe you were discussing it with your wife. I forgot, but you were correlating the experience you were having with your son who was very young at the time, and you were and I can only imagine like in moments like that you're traveling and. You know, you're away from a young kid. I mean, that that's that I, I just from my own personal experience. I know after a while that kind of wears on you. You do, you know, whenever you see somebody else's kid, you know, they're interacting with their kids. You miss your own kid. Oh, of course. Maybe not. Maybe not interacting with the foreskin as much. But you know, you still <laughs> correct. It is. It is a constant reminder that you're gone. You know, and it's and then the flip side is that you know now with family dinner, uh, with wild game kitchen. Uh, that uh, premieres in just a, a couple of weeks on Outdoor Channel uh, with Iron Chef on Netflix. Um, my, uh, I, I miss and, and react to different things there or celebrate the games that I've made. I, I've, I come from a, a big family. We used to celebrate a lot of different things together. And uh, that no, family. No, got... you say big families like your 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 mother, father, you. You had like siblings. Yes, or you talk about cousins. More extended, and, no, like, cousins. Yeah, yeah, extended yeah. family. So we celebrated quite frequently uh, as a family and did a lot of stuff at my grandmother's house. And then you know divorces, deaths. All of a sudden, it, it you know vanished in the blink of an eye. And so now with family dinner, I get to you know be in thirty different family homes a year. And enjoy their celebration. So even though I'm the discreet observer and, of course, obviously participant, I'm cooking a dish for them. They're cooking for me. Um, I get to, you know, get all of those itches scratched uh, by someone else's family. So the, the you know, both things are true. You can you can be sad and be reminded of what you're missing. And you can also be the beneficiary of something that you're getting. You know, you're the only other person that I have ever interacted with who said that and, and had a similar experience. And that is a thought that came to my mind. I used to have – the way you explained it, it's almost exactly the way I explained it. You know, grew up, uh, you know, a uh, Jewish kid, North Dallas, small family. But we had a pretty good extended family. And then the, the folks start passing away or whatever. Now you're down to a really, like, uh, all those traditions are kind of like, you know. Yep. They're more just yep. memory things I tell my kids, you know. So – uh, and you know, the, you mentioned you spent a lot of time at grandmother's. I did the same thing. And and before we go, I'm very curious because I I never got a recipe from my grand from my uh, from my grandparent. Maybe just one. And one of the things mm. I always wanted from her was her kugel recipe. 
but I never got that. And I need a good recipe for Kugel. And I think I might have to tap you, you know, for that if 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 you know one. We uh, we got a great one on my website. There, what is it's just andrewzimmern.com, right? Yeah, and it's it's we, we have gazillions of recipes there, but we have a whole uh, Passover and Hanukkah package we have a thanksgiving package we have a christmas package we have the tailgate i mean everything that you could people celebrate we've aggregated fantastic recipes uh for and there is a kugel there that is uh absolutely delish that's one of the things that when your family gets smaller you lament and you remember like god i remember you know when the family used to get along you know Mm -hmm. um (laughs) you know family politics and then you walk into these different situations which I think is really interesting about the family dinner because uh, I can't remember exactly where you were, but it was a family who had, they're on a farm, I think it's in the Midwest somewhere. The Aaron's family, she was Russian, he was uh, Minnesotan. They had met when he had gone over to Russia on a mission trip. Uh, I think it maybe you were over, oh gosh, it was, the, for some reason the sound of music comes to mind. Where, where am I Oh thinking no, we here? were with the Von Trapps in Vermont yeah, okay. at their farm, yeah. Yeah, okay, that, so it, it's when you're coming in, you're not just coming in and experiencing a meal, but you're coming in and experiencing lots of family stuff, you know. Well, well, and it, and embarrassingly, I mean, look, cameras are rolling and releases are signed. So when you turn to the Von Trapp family and say, so, do you guys sing? And there's like a silence in the room and someone says, no, no one sings. And they they begin to tell you that everyone would talk to, oh, sing something, sing something. And you get why none of them sing. They're very accomplished in other areas. And the the patriarch of the family, Johannes, is, uh, oof, I want to say he's probably 90, uh, was uh, the littlest baby when they're crossing the mountains, right? And then his memory as growing up, ages 0 to 10, is arriving in America and being, and if you're single digits, you don't want to be pimped out on a stage having to perform with your family. A lot of the other kids liked it, but he did not. And so there was no singing. And you could just feel America just groan at the same. But it was also a real surprise for me. And to your point, you sort of feel like you touched a nerve and something that is talked about within the family and uh, or has been a topic of discussion uh but yeah there are fabulous wonderful people extremely accomplished equestrians extremely accomplished uh skiers uh and obviously they have a huge their resort in Stowe is both a farm a craft brewery um a uh you know they raise all their own meat for the restaurants there. It's a uh, cross-country skiing center that is uh, world-renowned. So they they have a very great uh, local presence up there in Stowe, but they choose to just stick to themselves and do their thing. And yeah, it was pretty funny. How hard is it for you to keep track, not even keep track, but what, when you were, would it be a family or a trip or an experience you've had, how does it stick with you is it is it a lot of times the place or what makes something memorable to typically in your experience? Uh, learning something. Um, now I, I, I learn something new every day. Uh, so it, it's it's a um, it, it, it's a lesson of uh, of comparable you know learning growth, right? I mean, I go out on trips all the time. I always learn something. The things that are the stickiest to me, the things that I remember the most about is where I learned the most. And uh, that's the hierarchy and it descends downward to the things where I learn something, but the least. Um, and uh, I think that's always what it is. Um, the, the trips that stick with me. And I think the, the ones that the audience trips into the most and really gets off on are the ones where I am enjoying myself and I'm enjoying myself most when I'm seeing things that are new that I've not seen before. Isn't that funny? The more, I think Anthony Bourdain always used to quote somebody that, and I'm going to mangle this quote, but the more you learn, the more you realize you just don't know, you know, I know nothing. Oh, of course. You know? of course. Uh, and that, that has to be exciting because you get a little bit older. I was speaking with someone the other day and I was like, you know, one of the joys of my life is realizing, Oh, that's a thing I didn't know, you know, kind of pushing yourself. Now just kind of going little origin story real quick. I know you originally, you grew up in New York. Did you grow up 
in New York proper or Brooklyn or, or, or in the city? Man- Where did you grow Manhattan. Up? Born in Manhattan, raised in Manhattan, 1961, Mount Sinai Hospital. It's where it all began. What did, you, what did your, um, your folks do when you were growing up? My dad was in advertising. My mother was a designer. Uh, I had a uh, what by any description would be called a privileged uh, upbringing. Uh, private schools, never wanting really for anything. Um, and uh, of course, you know, while this is all happening, I'm also a, you know becoming a selfish, self-centered brat. Uh, got involved early in drugs and alcohol, became a user of people and a taker of things, uh, homeless, thieving, drug addict and alcoholic. Uh, by the time I was uh, in my late twenties, my parents were so proud and, uh, you know, and, and this is after, you know, education at two of the finest schools, uh, in the country, um, with with global reputations and I was a complete and total failure in every possible way and went into a room to try to kill myself. It didn't work. Uh, woke up a couple days later and a couple days after that wound up in Minnesota where I was, uh, I, I came to in a treatment center and uh, I've been sober ever since and that was 30 plus years ago and been living in Minnesota ever since. Your story intrigues me more than most because it's like, here is a New York kid, but you've fully adopted the Twin Cities as kind of like, you know, you know, you've got two very unique kind of identities there, you know, growing up in New York and and, and spending time in the Midwest, which would have been considered flyover state by a lot of coastal people, but you really embraced it. And, uh, and I mentioned the thing about empathy before. Do you think your experience, uh, you know, uh, just m- much like Ethan Anthony Bourdain. I'm not saying you'll had identical experiences, but I certainly think that when you, when things really, you know, you feel like you have your hands off the steering wheel and whatever evolves in your life, you can empathize with other people much easier. Do you th- is that accurate in your experience? Uh, I, I actually think it's an understatement. I, I think, you know, and, and, and Joseph Campbell wrote about this uh, in the hero's journey. I mean, a lot of people have, and, and I'm no hero. I am, um, it, you know, but, but, You know, Campbell's theory, uh, and I think it's true and has been widely accepted now, is uh, when you've been through the fire, you know, when you have had the Phoenix experience uh, and coming back from tragedy and rising from ashes, um, if you survive, you you have a skill set that other people don't have. It's pure and simple. And I've I've had this, you know, I've I've studied this now for, you know, anecdotally for 30 some odd years. And it is it's universally true. And I think for, uh, you know, some people have to go through what I did. That was a pretty low bottom. Other people don't need to have as low a bottom. But it is a transformative experience. And if it doesn't make you more. I'll just use your words. Uh, empathetic with the human condition around the world, uh, more in tune with the trials and tribulations of your fellow man. I think you've wasted life's greatest lesson. Now you had all those experiences, but travel was something you were doing even when you were younger. I, I seem to remember an episode of your father, you went somewhere in France or it could have been in Spain. It was somewhere. Uh, and you say your father would had taken you there when you were younger. And, um, and I believe you had even brought him back, if I'm not mistaken, on us. I, you know, my, my memory. No, is you're correct. The, no, 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 you're absolutely correct. And, you know, I, I, I've referenced this a lot. I, I was lucky enough to travel around the world several times with my dad. He was uh, one of the people responsible for running an international, you know, advertising agency. And we traveled a lot. And he loved to travel to eat and eat to travel. So even when we weren't working, although I went on a lot of work trips with him, uh, it, it was, you know, we, we also went on a lot of fun trips, uh, as well. Every year we love to ski. So we would go every year to Europe, ski somewhere for a week or 10 days, then go visit a city, uh, for four or five days. So, uh, and, and yes, very famously as a five-year-old, I've sat in, you know, Les Isles when it, when it was the, the, the place for all the seafood trading where the boats came in in Paris, uh, on the river, 
um, you know, picking Bigorneau uh, and drinking pastis at eight or nine years old while my dad was doing a having a business dinner three tables over uh, reading my book uh, and un- not understanding why I was so flushed and giddy. Um, I sat with him in a uh, humble uh, taverna outside of Valle de los Cayeros in Spain, where uh, ironically Franco is buried uh, now. But uh, this this restaurant under the Roman aqueduct there, and you know they walk up to you and they basically ask you lamb or pig, and you pick one, and then all the other courses come before it. But at the end, out comes a a newborn uh, lamb or or pig piglet and uh cooked and uh, you eat the whole thing that's your portion is this small roasted animal um and what preceded it were were angulas these tiny little uh elvers baby eels that swim from the sargasso sea up into the rivers where they will grow uh and become very large freshwater eels and you know this was the experience of my childhood my father gave that to me on trip after trip after trip after trip. So it's no wonder why I eventually got into doing what I do, because I'm just a paler version of, of him. And yes, you are, you are also correct. We, at, at one point, you know, when you start in television, you don't call any shots at all. Uh, you just say yes to everything and show up. And then if the show is successful, it all kind of flips around and everyone's asking you. And uh, I think it was season two or three, I... I told the producers we're going to do a show in Portland, Maine, and we're going to do it with my dad and let him show me his town that he was living in at the at the time. And uh, what was that? Where he's from, or that's where he? No, he to. spent the last twelve years of his life there. Uh, he wanted to move. He was born and bred in New York City uh, in the late forties. Got a house out in Long Island, so he had a summer place out there. And then it just became too crowded for him. So in his 70s, uh, you know, he and his partner moved up to Portland, Maine uh, and lived there for 10, 12 years uh, before both of them passed. And um, it was an amazing uh, time to actually have a show where I got to shoot with him. And at the very end, we're at this big party tasting a whole bunch of local strange things. Uh, that we shot on a friend of his, a friend of his has an island uh, there. It, it sounds very uh, uh, bougie, but, you know, they're, in Maine, there's a lot of little tiny islands and they're passed from family to family. And he knew someone who had a, a small, humble uh, place uh, in, in the bay. Uh, and we shot there and I got my son in the show. So at one point, my son, my father and I are all eating. Um, and I remember that vividly because i mean if i got hit by a bus tomorrow uh I, i've immortalized the three of us together chowing down so i'm i'm pretty happy with that you know it kind of brings it back to what you were saying about your uh, magnolia channel uh show it, it's um it's like you can do all these really wonderful sometimes extravagant or really amazing have amazing opportunities but what re and, and my my youngest daughter get so mad at me because I'm always taking pictures She's like daddy really please this is the one teenager on earth that doesn't post to Instagram but anyway the I'm like but I'm like I want this you know this is important to me um mm-hmm. you know when we were on a cruise a few weeks ago she gave me a little more latitude I was allowed to take more pictures you know but you know getting the uh, multi generation the, the the family together there were you noticing that your son was into it or is he kind of like, oh god, here's dad doing his well, he TV was like thing again? Three. Well, he was like three or four. He loved being in the show when he was little. Uh, I think if we tried today, he would uh, he would not be. Now you said he's seventeen. 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 I got one of those. Also, just started his freshman year at uh, Loyola. When you were kind of coming around and and you're in Minnesota, you're hitting the reset button. What? Pulled you into the culinary world. What what was the genesis of? I mean, was that even your original plan when you were going oh, yeah. to college? Well, it had, it had been. My, you know, I went to college because my father said. Well, <laughs> I'll back up. When I was four, I I cooked with my grandmother as a young child, with my mom and dad as an older child, and I had an aptitude for it. And you know, my dad taught me what to do. You know that. No one called it foraging. You just, 
you know, it was the sixties, you know, you, you threw a line in the water and caught a striped bass. You went down to the jetty and pulled mussels. You, you raked clams on a cloudy morning. You know, we, we, I mean, this was what we did in the summertime. And so I learned how to do, uh, and loved food, uh, so that when my father said, you know, when the spring were preceding my 14th birthday, uh, which is in the summer, he said, uh, but I hope you know there's no more allowance. You know, what are you going to do for a summer job? And I said, work in restaurants. I knew right away what I wanted to do. And all my other friends were working at the landscape company or at the gas station or at the supermarket. And, and I worked in restaurants. And we were lucky we had a friend who owned a seafood restaurant who was willing to hire me. And that's where I went. It was called The Quiet Clam on Montauk Highway, just as you entered the village of East Hampton. Um, and I worked there summers in high school and begged my parents to work odd nights during the school year in New York to be in restaurants. And they let me do that. And so the die was, I knew when I was six years old, I wanted to work in food. I mean, that was accepted by my family. And- but how lucky, how lucky are you though? that that Cause I had the similar experience. I remember going, I want to do this thing for me. It was radio or acting or, mm-hmm. you know, but I knew every time I tried to push and go some other direction, I went to a really good high school and I was like, oh, maybe medicine, you know, Jewish boy, oh, be a good shot, be a yeah. Jewish doctor. You know, I was like, it just didn't light my fire. I just right. knew. And I think I consider anybody that's got that. It can be a bumpy road, but it's, it's, it's you're really lucky when you can bring that to fruition. Knew, always knew what I wanted to do. And, my, and you know, my, my father encouraged it in a sense, but he said, don't pass up college. He said, even if you want to be the, you know, the, the own restaurants or, or be a chef or whatever you want to do, learning to read, write and think critically at a higher level is really important. And so I went to, I went to college and he was right because ultimately once I, I mean, I wasted a lot of my time in college, uh, but ultimately uh, my, my storytelling uh, capability, my, my style of storytelling, I learned studying art history at Vassar college from, from the first day of Art History 101 when, you know, Dr. Susan Koretsky put the first slide up of the first, you know, class, you know, of my freshman year, um, I learned a way of deciphering the world. Um, she put up a painting, Northern Renaissance, seven, 16th, late 16th century, and she asked everyone in the class to write down what they saw in the painting and what it meant. And everyone wrote down chair, table, dog, bowl of fruit, window, hat, scarf, dress, necklace. And then, you know, she asked for everyone to read their list, three or four people. Everyone had the same thing. And you could tell halfway through this was her, you know, class one, slide one set up for the, for the year. And she then stepped back and spent a half an hour telling us everything about late to 16th century Flemish life there. You know, it, it, no one had noticed that in the, uh, in the fruit bowl was a banana, but bananas don't grow in, in what is now Holland. So it had to have come from somewhere else, right? And so it indicated the wealth of the family. And she just went on and on and on. Sherlock Holmes life. He was like a locked room. Yeah, I was, about, I was Christie, literally about to say that. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's like Hercule Poirot couldn't have done a better job. And I found myself uh, 45, 40 years later. No, less. 35 years. Later, whenever. I'm in, a, I'm in a jungle in Nicaragua. I'm shooting the second season of Bizarre Foods. Um, and I'm in a, 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 a jungle market. And someone puts a bowl of very rustic chanfina, which is a chop stew made of organ meat, um, in my hands. And we're, we're in a jungle, so I know that it's bush meat. It's not goat or chicken or whatever. It's, it's made with, with uh, animals that live in the, in the forest. And um, these jungle markets spring up once a week where, you know, vendors are bringing all their wares or tribal people convene. And, you know, once a week or once every two weeks, people can trade exchange news of the day. Um, and there's always people cooking so that folks can buy food. And, uh, I started 
very naturally telling, it was a real turning point for me in my career. I mean, I'm not saying that I sucked the first year, but I was nowhere near the storyteller I was prior to my experience uh, with that bowl of Chenfina that I, that I am now. Well, of, of course, if you think you're just as good now as you were back then, or you, yeah. you haven't grown at all, so now you can actually recognize the growth. That's a good yeah, thing. Yeah, and it, you, you see, you know, I, I, I held up the soup, and I said, you know, if you look at the soup, you can tell everything about the people here by it. And I, I started to do what Dr. Koretsky did uh, in that art class, our history class long ago, which was tell my audience, look into the camera and tell them everything about this people and this time and this place in this country through this bowl of stew. And uh, it was a real turning point uh, for me. And it was, uh, it, it still is my favorite form of storytelling is being able to, you know, even if it's a cheeseburger at a local shop, you, you can tell a lot about a place and a culture. Uh, I have famously said this. Uh, it's been quoted a lot. I love museums, uh, but I can learn more about a country by going to a local market and eating and talking to people than I can by going into their local museum. That's for sure. Yeah, and I lo- one of the things I think you're a Jedi Knight at doing, which is, I mean, for your vocation is essential, is communicating the moment and what it's like aesthetically, what it tastes like. I remember you got, like, I remember you got, what is it, the little... Sh- Shellfish, the OPH, I think, called like a mm-hmm. salty something gummy bear. So, however, you described it, I'm like, okay, I get a feeling for what the, it's the most random description, but I think what you do wonderfully uh, is really transport people. And I think that kind of going back to what you're discussing before is how much is it moving the needle culturally on kind of opening people up to other people and ideas. I think it certainly helps. I think, you know, being able to be a very capable storyteller is, is, you know, you're part and parcel. That's what you do, you know? Uh, yeah, but-, but a lot a lot of people, do, this, is, this is what's fascinating to me. So many other folks forget that there is someone on the other side of the camera watching six months later. And they're not going to have, they're not going to hear the rain in the distance or smell the loamy, earthy, you know, mildewy smell of that jungle. They're not going to taste the food. They're not going to see the smile on every person who's in there. So you have to, you, if, if it's your responsibility to tell them. You're the avatar for the audience. I think a lot of people forget that. I, I, I really do. And by the way, I'm lucky to have had amazing mentors and great teachers and folks who told me to pay attention to that stuff. Um, you know, and yes, is a certain part of it... Um, the dies already cast by the time they picked up the first camera because of what happened to be the first 33, 34 years of my life. Yes, to a certain degree, but some of it's actually learned. Some of it is paying attention, having someone remind you that not only is there someone, you know, who one day, and it could be the same viewer, right? So one day, Mark, you're, you're coming to the, to the, the show I make, whatever it is. You just had a tough day and you pop a beer and you just want to sit down and be entertained. And then some days you're like eager to like, you know, hey, hey, you know, whoever's in the house, come take a look at this. And you sit down and you learn something because it's just really cool and fascinating or maybe just beautiful. And you learn a lot about the Faroe Islands because I'm about to die in freezing water while, you know, uh, orcas circle our our Zodiac boat. Um, But no matter what it is. You have to be there for all people all the time and not ostracize members of your audience. Oh, certainly. But I think the way the way people come, like you said, the guy just maybe popping a beer, maybe another day, watch the same episode. Maybe he's more actively watching it. He's going to pick up on something I know for myself. I think and I don't want to conflate. I know I mentioned Anthony Bourdain before. I don't want to conflate. Y'all are two very unique voices, but. There are so many parallels that I think, had y'all not had the life y'all had, I don't think y'all would be as effective and as memorable. And I think that you're you're making all these jewel boxes of experiences for people for even, even the future. And I, and I and I just I always sat down as like thinking, I truly enjoy both these guys for their own special sauce. You know what you have to offer, but there are beautiful, wonderful parallels in in what you're kind of like. 
Did you ever, ever speak with Anthony Bourdain and go, okay, how are we going to differentiate our shows? We're out there sort of doing something similar. And he gives you these wonderful gentle ribs going, okay, on a show, he's like, this is something more for Zimmern. You know? (laughs) Kind of. Kind of. It was was actually even better than that. Um, You know, we both grew up in New York. We both were smart asses. We both uh, had, you know, different types of addiction issues. Um, we both worked in New York at the same time as line cooks. We both, uh, we, we had both gone to Vassar college. He was really? there a couple of years. Yeah. He was there a couple of years before I was. Well, I know even, even his father, I remember he used to travel with his family when he was younger. You know, mm-hmm. I know there was, so that's right. So, so uh, please that's don't, right. I, I'm d- certainly not saying uh, y'all are just alike. I'm not saying that. Oh no, Sanders we're very you. different. We're very, very different, but this <laughs> yeah. was what was fantastic. We, we became friends, uh, but he loved, I mean, he, I think he took more pleasure uh, giving me a ton of shit about stuff. Uh, that 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 was his favorite thing because, as he often would say, he said, "You know, we, we go, we you know, we both go to um, you know the Congo. We both eat uh, the same warthog meal with two different tribes. I don't know how he does it because at least I get to drink, right? Uh, the implication being, it's easier to eat that stuff if you've had a few." Um, and, uh, you know, we explored the world telling our stories much different, uh, in in much different styles. Um, but we basically did the same job and we would, you know, he would sometimes call me or send me a, a, a a text or an email with like, yup, you know, I'm going to such and such because he knew that we were trying to get in to that country too. Um, and he took tremendous pleasure uh, in it actually became an epic part of his story in in landing the 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 Beirut show while we were trying to and and I took great pleasure in beating him to Cuba and to Syria and he took great pleasure in beating me into you know Iran and then it it closed down we were actually on our way we we're using the same fixer there Jason Rezaian who is now with the Washington Post. Uh, and, you know, three weeks before we were leaving for uh, Tehran, uh, the country closed to Americans and Jason was uh, imprisoned. Um, so, you know, we had a lot to talk about. Then we were both parents of kids the same age who traveled and never saw our kids. Um, you know, we both had experienced divorce. We both had experienced so many of the same things. So as the years went by, uh, we became closer. He was an amazing person, the most charismatic human being I've ever met. I think that the things we talk about storytelling and I always kind of reference him as sort of like one of those guys would be a big brother. You know, the one guy, it's always trying to, there is wisdom. There is that, that, that kind of like storytelling referencing books. I would never read or author with you. There is, there's, there's, there's this infectious enthusiasm. It's a dip. You definitely have your own brand without a doubt. And, but I found so many parallels and I think that your shows, and this is not just, in fact, I know your shows are important because if somebody sits down and watches it and goes, oh, yeah, there's that the food is the common denominator no matter what the culture. And in it, the irony is you went all over. Now, of course, you've done U.S.-based shows, but you've been all over the world. But I really think right now doing that the, the family dinner idea, I think that people watch that. I think there needs to be a lot more of that right now, at least in the U.S. Um, I, I agree 100 percent. I mean, it's. You know, look, we've we've never been. I, I'm, I make no. I, I don't hide my age at all. I'm 61, um, and I, there's never been a, a time in my life where I've been more scared about the divisive nature of our culture, our politics, every, every factor of of American life, or the divide between haves and have-nots. I mean, it's just you know, division and divide are words I could use. You know, so much. So anything that I can do, that. I think it's my responsibility in a sense. You know, when when Magnolia came to us and said, we want a intuitive content show that's my production company, I immediately said family dinner because we we, we put a family dinner in every episode of Bizarre Foods. Um, we didn't label it or circle it, but we put one in there because I felt it was important. And I knew it worked. So I said, let's do family dinner. And then they came back to me a couple of weeks later and said, well, we can't imagine this being hosted by anyone other than you. Would you do it? And I said, sure. Uh, and, uh, it, it's a fantastic show that way. And, you know, is it at times a little bit saccharine? Sure. Is it at times extremely, 
uh, revelatory about who we are and why we do what we do as human beings? Absolutely. And everything in between. But I do think it's it's a show that's ideally suited for for now. Yeah, and speaking of the creation, and, and you know, of course, I I narrate TV shows, and and I understand a lot of the production process. I understand you know the sizzle reels, trying to get a show off the ground. How many ideas do you sit down? I mean, throughout the say the span of a year, and what, I don't want to say the market's saturated with food programming. It's just there is a lot of options and a lot of different flavors, no pun intended, out there. How do you come up with your ideas on the span of a year? How many ideas are you coming up with for a concept for a show? And how do you know, like, yes, this one's where I'm going to put my heart into this one thing? Uh, well, uh, you know, we have a I, I'm blessed to own a, a production company that's a real screen international 100 company. Uh, the development team that uh, is over at Intuitive uh, churns ideas on a weekly basis. Uh, you know, some weeks it's you know, three or four, some weeks it's 10 because a network has asked for a bunch of log lines on a certain type of show by request. Right. Um, and so we will come up. I, I mean, this, I mean, look, some get discarded the day after you come up with them, but they will, they will develop, you know, 200 ideas across the course of a year. Uh, beyond, uh, you know, someone in a meeting saying, hey, what about this? I mean, it, science is just one step further than that, but uh, it's discussed. And, uh, you know, we're, we're lucky if five or six of those become, become shows. Just one last question regarding Anthony Bourdain. I, I was curious and naturally... Of course, it was sad. It was difficult. But how how did you find out and how did it initially land? Because I know my daughter called me and told me I was like, it, it, it was a very odd day that this, to say the very least. But how did how did that affect you that day? Oh, it was, I mean, horrific. Um, so the night beforehand, we had been shooting till 11 midnight in Philadelphia And, uh, you know, we have to give the crew a certain number of hours off. So my call time, instead of being 7 a.m., was 11.30 or noon. And so I was sleeping in. And, you know, my alarm goes off at 10, 10 10.30. And, uh, you know, you hit your, you know, my iPhone, I hit the off button and up pops my home screen. And there are what appear to be hun- well, what were hundreds of alerts and messages. And I immediately panicked uh, because the only reason I could think of that there would be that much traffic on my phone would be if something had happened to my child and people were trying to get a hold of me. And uh, I grabbed it and there's like phone message, phone message, phone message. And some of them were friends of mine that were reporters and I was, but they were food side. And then I saw that then the C then the alerts from the news. And your brain's trying to put together quickly what is going on in this. What's going yeah. on. And I saw that, you know, I think, I forget which news uh, group I, I subscribed to so many came up where the first line, because you, you only see a little snippet uh, said Anthony Bourdain dead at age. And I, I, I just, I was in shock. And so I opened up my phone and I saw that several, uh, reporters that I knew had called me. I called one of them back and I said, uh, you, you left me a message. I I said, I just woke up. What happened? And they filled me in. And I wound up, uh, I then called our producers who were with me in Philadelphia. They had, they knew it. They had found out an hour earlier when they got up and they were like, look, if you want to take the day off, we'll just, we'll just cancel today's shoot. And I'm like, absolutely not. Um, and, uh, he had given, I, I gave him a lot of shit about some of his shoes and he had given me a pair of shoes. I actually had them in my bag, and I wore the shoes he gave were me. Were they that shoes day. or the cowboy boots? Because I know he had uh, loved cowboy. They boots. were. They were desert. They were Clark's desert boots, um, 
which he had developed an affection for. And uh, I, I called a lot of people back because we delayed our start. And I, you know, I, I checked in with his, with his family. I mean, I was, I knew his wife, his daughter. Um, and then of course the, you know, at 11, 10 o'clock that night, we're shooting at Zahav restaurant in Philadelphia at the end of a day where I was like half paying attention every other second, I'm on the phone with a reporter or tech me. And part of the responsibility I felt was so many people are going to give the wrong impression, say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing. But you're um, in a unique position to give wonderful context. Well, you know. and, and, and so, so I, I felt, uh, that it was okay for me to, to respond to a lot of these, you know, everyone wanted my take uh, on it. Now you have to remember he's Tony's traveling with his best friend, Eric repair. Eric's not available. Eric, I mean, just, just horrific. So, um, and the family's non-responsive. So it, 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 then it falls to tier two friends to sort of like put the kibosh in the right thing. Um, you know, and, and do the, you know, make sure that, that the right thing is done. And so I, and I wound up going on a couple CNN shows, you know, that night they sent a live truck over to the restaurant that we were at. And, you know, I did a couple of, a couple of those um, shows and it was just, it was a very, very, very sad night. I, I, I can certainly say that not only was he the most charismatic human being I ever met, but I think he's one of the most important voices of of my generation. And I think, you know, 50, 100 years from now, they will still be uh, selling his books and talking about him in the same way that we do now. I, I couldn't agree more. And I, th- I think that it, it will have to be with time that people can look back. Uh, like I said, they're the, the same thing with the shows you create. They do create not only insight, but it's also a time capsule. And to a degree, I think that oh, that for sure. Showing... He he wanted to craft art pieces out of a lot yeah. of his shows, you know, and, and you know the 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 black and white show, and he let me know like, all the different things that he would do to try to be creative uh, was fantastic. Now, do you think the Roadrunner documentary for, for the for the lay person? Do you think them watching that that they got it pretty right as far as articulating? The Anthony Bourdain experience. Do you think the Roadrunner documentary uh, got that done? Uh, it, to be honest with you, and I've tried a couple times, I've not been able to get more than halfway through it. I mean, the and 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 part of that is, and I have I, I'm not one of those people who has a who has a problem with them, you know, using AI to have him narrate, hear his voice narrating things he wrote. Um, I, I, you know, it's, you know, I don't have quibbles with, with that kind of thing. I, I just, you know, uh, I knew him. I, I, uh, he was my friend. I, uh, and, and so other people have to decide for themselves. My, my understanding, uh, is from a lot of people said for the most part, they did get it right. Um, and, and certainly gave enough of a taste, uh, of it. Um, I, you know, but I've not been able to, to make it through it. And I've tried several times. I just, I, I run out of, of emotional energy for it. It's not that I get upset and have to turn it off. I, I just, I have no desire to watch. And I know it's only one of a handful of people that may be able to, to say that, just like I have no interest in, in seeing it. And it's not a knock against them. There's only one episode of uh, Parts Unknown I haven't seen. It's the New Orleans episode because uh, I, you know, I'm a Texas boy, but I live in New Orleans now. I've been, uh, been here for quite some time. And, and the, I remember one of his episodes, he went to a restaurant that was the best mufflot in New Orleans. You know, he, he was like, you do the same thing. You're not doing the travel guide way of doing things, you know. And I, I remember thinking, that's I just can't bring myself to watch that episode just uh, the the most the most recent episode on the the No Reservation show I watched the New Orleans he he always got it right and you do as well and and when we yep. were um you know when I travel somewhere I I, I inevitably I'm gonna look up what did Andrew go there let me go watch that episode thank God for streaming and I've got Discovery uh, which I, I'm a big fan of the Discovery Plus app I mean five bucks a month is 
not trying to sell them, but it's it's of all the streamers out there, really is. Uh, got a lot of content. Well, massive, li- massive library. And now that they've added, you know, now the Warner Brothers side is on there, the movies. And I, 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 I'm not going to disagree with you. Of, of course, as someone who made four or five shows in New Orleans, uh, I'm dying to know you're, you have to watch some of mine and tell me if I got any of it right. But I will, I will say this. There is a restaurant that, uh, I, after being taken there and getting turned on to it by a chef friend have visited on every time that I've gone back there and that's R&O's uh, <laughs> out on the front, yeah. levee in Metairie. What? Okay, see, now now you're a local. If you know R&O's, it's not sexy. It's, you know, it's not, uh, you know, it, it but it is a local's place. Uh, the, it's incredible that I, I actually in, in an episode that I shot there, I got up and stood in the middle of the dining room at lunch. There's 200 people in there. It's mobbed line of people out the door. And I stood up all local, by the way. And and I and I stood up and I quieted everyone down. Cameras are rolling. And I said, is there anyone here who's not a local and a regular and not a single hand went up, and I just like raised my hand, and everyone laughed. It was a great moment in the show, but just to il- there was no other way to illustrate to my audience how much of kind of like an insider's place it was, um, and it, it's great. I mean, fried seafood and gumbo and a, a beef, an un it's it's never on anyone's list of best po' boys, but they have a fried oyster po' boy, a fried shrimp po' po' boy. But their beef po' boy is what all my chef friends go there for because of their gravy. And I have one friend who does an oyster and it's a yeah. surf and turf. He does fried with oysters beef. and beef with beef yeah. gravy. And I'm just – it's it's mind-bogglingly good. I just – I love everything about r Yeah, that is – it's it's – every age is in there too. You know, it's, it's you can tell it's a local spot. There's a place next to it called Dini's. Um, I think I think you may have gone to Dini's. I, I seem to remember. I I did not. But if there's a place next, this is this is what's so great about life. Someone says to you, "Oh, have you been to the place next door?" It's like, well, no, I haven't because I don't live there. So whenever I go, I go to R and O's. I'm not going there to go to the place next door. And now I'm like, check out the place next door. I will tell you that. Very few things turn me on. Living in New Orleans, I will say this, being a Dallas boy, having lived and worked in Los Angeles as well, having been here about, on and off about 20 years, I can tell you the two things I'm tired of seeing them open up are po' boy places and daiquiri shops, because they're everywhere. Everybody does yeah. it. Yeah. And once you have a place yeah. that starts doing something really well, it's I imagine Philadelphia cheesesteaks. You get a lot. Everybody starts doing them, but they're, they're the kind of elite few. And there's this place, Dini's, they do something. They do a uh, barbecue shrimp po' boy. And it's not barbecue like barbecue sauce. It's a right, buttload right. of butter. New Orleans and, style barbecue. Oh, yeah. yeah. And you go there and you go, just take a bottle of Lipitor, go to town on it. Because if you don't, you're missing out. <laughs> so, yeah. And I love I love New Orleans style barbecue shrimp in a cast iron pan with lots of rosemary and butter. and. Well, you, you know, know, that's one of the things I wanted to ask you about heat. is you've been to New Orleans. They cannot replicate what's in New Orleans anywhere else on earth the way it is in New Orleans. But the thing is, if you want something besides the unique fine dining, the Antoine's, Galatoire's, things like that, it's it's a little bit more of a challenge uh to find those ethnic kind of places that are not, and I don't know the phrase for it, maybe you can help me out, but I it's almost like gentrified food where, yeah, oh, they have, I'm not saying this necessarily the case, but let's say African. Well, it's going to be a little bit out of the reach for the average person because it's going to be a little bit more on the fancy side where you go to New York, you want great Indian, just ask your cab driver, you're going to go spend five bucks and have a full meal, you know. Um but that's the one thing about New Orleans. I wish we had more stuff from elsewhere, you know. Well, but, but people, New Orleans is the, uh, there's only a couple cities in the world that I believe fit this bill. When you shut your eyes and you say the word New Orleans twice out loud, you can smell it and taste it. And you cannot say that about other cities. And the reason is, is because the food is its own. I, I don't, I, you know, nobody goes to, I, I've had friends go to Beijing and ask me for a great place for a hamburger because they don't want to eat Chinese food all the time. And I said, well, why the, I mean, well, first of all, I, I think it's a ridiculous question, ridiculous supposition. And I, I have, I, 
personally am so offended when anyone I know asks me that question. But no one goes down to New Orleans and says, geez, do you know a good Japanese place for, you know, now, I'm sure locals down for locals, there, yeah. like no, you oh, no, just no, no. expressed, wished you had, God, sometimes I just feel like a great schnitzel, you know, but... God, that is, that is almost like weird you say that. I literally was watching something a couple days ago of you. You had, it was some kind of a German thing where they had, oh, God. It was, um, I, I don't mean to the interrupt. The schnitzel you. sandwich at the state fair? No, it was. it was On it my was, Instagram? Uh, no, it was um, bits and pieces of, uh, shit. Okay, I, I can't remember. But it was, it was, I was thinking well, schnitzel and spatula point, and things like that. I'm like, oh, those are kind yeah, of things my I point want. is, my, my point is that. You know, New Orleans, like Portland, Maine, where my dad retired, is one of those cities that has a very small population, yet has, I mean, what does New Orleans get? 24 million visitors uh, uh, a year? It's unreal, yeah. It's an ungodly thing. And so relative to the, the residential population, New Orleans has the most number of restaurants. So this is pre-COVID. Uh, the most number of restaurants in any city in America per capita because just like Portland, Maine, it fills up with people, except New Orleans fills up 10 months a year, Portland, Maine, only three months, four months a year. Um, and so consequently, everybody wants to eat uh, there. And you also have to remember that even, you know, America's some of the most beloved food uh, in America, which is Italian food. Uh, I mean, it's globally uh, a favorite, um, has developed its own hybridized style. There is a unique aspect to uh, the New Orleans Italian restaurant. Oh, it's gravy. It's not sauce. In a certain style. Yeah. yeah, and and there's a lot of a lot of the Creole tinge, which is different than Cajun, um, has has sort of flown in there, and you know it's. You know, it's you take someone who who says, "Oh, are we going to eat Italian food tonight?" Sure, and you take them to two jocks, and it's you watch their eyes roll back in their head, and they're like, "This isn't Italian," yeah. and you're like, "Well, right, but it's New Orleans, right?" I mean, so there's so many places like that. I I I'm a big fan of that town. People understand Jefferson Parish. It's uh, yeah, Jefferson Parish is is very. Uh, a, a lot, they even have the Irish Italian parade here. I mean, Italian, a lot of influences. But I will tell you, the next time you're in New Orleans, we're kind of wrapping up here. But I do have to tell you, next time you're in New Orleans, I wouldn't be. Uh, well, I think I've, I've been through Katrina and all the hurricanes. I feel like I've earned yep. my stripes here, you know. Um, sure. But, uh, Anthony Bourdain went there, and I knew he got the, he, he he did what the smart people do in New Orleans: <clears throat> get a cab driver. It's kind of old, maybe a little crusty. Ask them where they eat. Because it's always sure. a great idea. But it's a uh, muffalata sandwich, a place called Norjo. It's an old Metairie. Uh, everybody goes to the French Quarter to get it. But this is just, it is unique. Uh, it's you got that olive dress, olive salad kind of thing. It's just, I'm thinking about, I mean, you can tell I haven't had anything to eat today so far. So goes, I'm, now I'm thinking about eating one of those. But it is truly the one of the best sandwiches I've ever had, you know. So my actually mm. used to, in, in the way they, New Orleans is, makes it unique is the street I used to live on in Old Metairie. I was like the three doors down from it. And literally down the street is is somebody converted their garage into an actual functioning bar. So that's one of the things you find in New Orleans, you know, you're, you're going to have somebody uh, in their in their garage is converted and now people come and drink there. It's just bizarre. Yep. Kinda. But yep. um. And as we wrap up, one of the things I love to do is my, my, my quick seven questions is to, uh, the first one, I'm, I'm talking probably the number one person on planet Earth right now when I ask this question. What is your favorite comfort food? It's my grandmother's roast chicken that I make now. My father made it, then I make it, and I still eat it twice a week. Really? A whole chicken? Mm-hmm. With pan gravy and, it, I mean, it's, I mean you know, chicken, little two and a half pounder. Uh, you know, but it feeds two or three people, but I have to make my grandmother's onion pan gravy. It has to be done her way, seasoned her way. Now, have I refined it a little bit? Sure. Uh, but I haven't chefied it up, uh, as some people like to say, it's still her chicken. Where, where are your people from though? I've always been curious about that. Germany. Germany. Okay. Well, they came over here in the 1840s. So 
you know, it's it, it was a long time ago. Oh, okay, because mine were the Ukrainians. Uh, okay. Actually, everybody, they say, you know, Jews from Europe, they all came through New York. No, there's a big contingent came through New Orleans or Mobile, Alabama, or, you know. Mine came through Charleston, South Carolina, and that's why they wound up in Atlanta and then after the Civil War walked to New York. Yeah, we were uh, we came through uh, Galveston. So, yeah, that's it's uh, it's an interesting documentary uh, called um, Shalom, y'all. You ought to see it sometime. It's kind of funny about all this. Oh, yeah. No, love it. Second question I got. You got a table, four seats, you three other people. You want to talk story for a few hours. Who are those three people uh, living or not? Who, who would you love to kind of get together uh, and just talk about life with for a while? Wow. Um, well, I'm just going to I have to give myself boundaries. Otherwise, it's an endless you know, I'm, I'm one of those people who has collected detail for so long, I can't, it, it would be staggering. Uh, because I do have a historical set, but I'll just go with a contemporary set. I'd like to have dinner with uh, David Simon, uh, who created uh, The Wire, amongst other in, incredible, incredible shows. Uh, James Carville... And uh, David Simon, James Carville, and um, I'll go with um, I'll go with Tony Blair. Really? Okay. Well, here, here's why. Here's why. Uh, Simon from Baltimore. And, and brilliant, by the way, is as fine a social, my favorite social commentator, perhaps, with his work. In, oh, he, did, his he did Treme work. also, I think, on HBO, uh, didn't he? Yeah. Oh, yeah, did phenomenal show, yeah. Um, and, um, you know, uh, James Carville, because I adore him and I just would like to be able to break bread uh, with him. But I need someone for all of us to ask questions of who would fill in blank spots and from an international, a, a, a non-American perspective. And um, I've, I'm lucky enough to work uh, sometimes with David Miliband because I do work with the International Rescue Committee and he was Blair's secretary, uh, you know, foreign secretary. And, uh, you know, I get a chance to talk to him sometimes. And Tony Blair is just... A fascinating guy, but he knows where all the bodies are buried. I want to talk to him about then and now. You know, Tony Blair is great because he was a he was the prime minister when we were going through from, from you know different political swings in the U.S. But he did he come in right after Margaret Thatcher? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember my okay. So mm -hmm. he you know because yep. she had her thing. She was a Reagan era you know, but he he kind of wrote a lot of our modern history. You know, yes, yeah, he did. I could definitely. But a James Carville, I, I, I saw him the other day. I wish more no news folks would be getting him on, giving commentary, because, I mean, it's theatrical common sense. You know, he, the guy's just, I love the way he articulates himself. He's the best. Um, now, next question. Who was your first, uh, when you were a kid, who was your first celebrity crush? My first celebrity crush. Um, oh, my gosh. Uh, well, I mean, not to not to put too find a point on it, but, you know, I'm 61, so the first celebrities that I ever saw that I was uh, attracted to were in the Playboy magazine's annual uh, movies uh, issue. And, and oh, annual men, movies issue, okay. Yeah, you know, the sex in movies issue. And so they they always had you know, incredible, you know, they, it was, and, and, and they were screen grabs of, of topless actresses. And, and, and so there were, and, and there were, I, I mean, this was, I mean, you have to see, this is through the lens of a 13 year old boy, right? Um, it was, uh, which is a very vibrant lens. Yes, yeah. it, it, it is. It is a very vibrant lens. And, uh, 1974 Jacqueline Bissett, was about as as good as it got for me at that time. Yeah, I uh, yeah. Somebody the other day brought up something which I don't think many guys in my like, I'm a little younger than you are, uh, but I but uh, somebody brought up Haley Mills. I was like, oh man. But anyway, I was thinking as when I was young, well, I didn't realize shows that were shot in the '60s 
you know, before you get a little older, you know, 9, 10, 11, you know, you start realizing, oh, wait a minute, this person's much older now. Mm -hmm. One of the last questions is if you're going to be on an island for a year, an island you love being on, but there is no streaming. You can only bring one DVD to watch a movie, one movie, and you can only bring one CD or an album. You know, what? what's that movie, what's that album going to be for you to hang on to for a year? The movie's got to be uh, Godfather Parts 1 and 2 because they are sold together on a single DVD set. So I'm going to, I'm going to twist, I'm going to tweak that a little bit. Uh, I, Have you I, seen the offer on uh, Paramount Plus by I have, chance? it's brilliant. It's brilliant. Oh, yeah. um, so, um, you know, I, I think that's the movie. And then... Uh, for music, uh, that is just, that's painful for someone who is such a music geek, uh, like well, myself. Well, see, the guitar behind you, is that for decoration or do you play? I do play. Uh, that's actually a Paul McCartney signed guitar, uh, that I got uh, four or five years ago when he was in Minneapolis. Um, really? yeah, it's a nice flex, right? Oh yeah. That's <laughs> my, that's my Paul McCartney autographed. Uh, guitar, very nice. Uh, that's, which I, which, uh, which I'm a big, uh, I'm a big fan of that one. Well, it's next um, to a baseball bat, so I'm imagining you, know, you got the music, you got the sports. You know, yeah, no, I got, the, I've got the whole thing. But you can see, I, I think, well, it's hard to pick up, but he signed it in silver on the black edging there. Um, so I think uh, I'll tell you the. Um, <sighs> this is going to sound. Uh, a little goofy, but I would go with the band's last waltz because it's got a lot of the music that I love and I can sing along with every song and it, it's got quiet, tender moments and it stomps like a son of a bitch when you want it to. So I'll go with the band's last waltz. Well, yeah, I'm thinking with the area you're growing up in, you were like, I was born in 73, you know, so and you're much the younger 70s than I are, am. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I noticed that the seventies kind of passed me by a little bit, but you were right in the thick of it, you know, as far as musical. Oh, I was, we would go on weekends to see, you know, Pink Floyd one weekend, Led Zeppelin the next weekend at the garden. And then on Thursday night, you'd go see the Ramones, uh, or, you know, whatever other punk music. I remember I saw, I saw all the you were, nights. I saw all the nights. ground zero. Oh yeah. I saw yeah. all the nights of, you know, the clash at bonds. I mean, I mean, just on and on and on. It was, so you're uh, a CBGB once or twice. In yeah. Your no many, cause all our older brothers and sisters, uh, of my friends would take us to those places when we were 10, 12, 13, 14. So first, first, concert I saw without my parents was 72, the Brown Sugar Tour that the Stones did, because my friend's older sister took us uh, in where Mick was riding the giant inflatable tongue uh, on stage, and, and I thought I died and went to heaven. I, I do envy folks a little bit, you know, the folks are a little bit older, uh, gen, gen X, you know, to, to a little bit older than that. They got, they got a good musical hit there. Um, now, the next question is, if you're going to be from the time you wake up, time you go to sleep, definition of a perfect day are the component parts for you. You're like, this was a good day. What, what's that for you? Uh, well, I had one Friday. Uh, I went to uh, I went to work, had a decent morning, bugged out and did something I really wanted to do. It spent a couple hours at the state fair, but doing something to help advance a cause and was stumping with a candidate here. And uh, went home, took a nap on the couch. Cause but, it was but just I, I don't want to interrupt you, but can we get Al Franken back? Is that possible? Can we uh, get him we're going to try. I just interviewed him this morning for my Substack. Uh, really? Andrew, okay. Yeah, andrewzimmer.substack.com. We're starting to do a lot of video interviews now. I just talked to Al. He's a friend of mine. So we just, we just spent some time with him this morning, uh, one of our first guests. Um, Took a little nap with the dogs and woke up to find out that some musician friends of mine were coming into town and landing at seven. And I just convinced them to come over for dinner. And I, I made everyone a big meal and sat around bullshitting with them till midnight. And it was I, I went to bed that night just thinking, well, that was a perfect day. Wasn't Isn't that great? Isn't that great when you perfect. have those? It's just you, you just when you can stop and go, OK, this is. I'm, when I was out of town with my kids a few weeks ago, I just had one of those moments, just like, this is just perfect. I'm loving it. I want to kind of breathe this in. Now, the last two questions. And if you were doing this, doing things like with you said, the United Nations or with 
all the, the things you yeah, do yeah. and with creatively what you're doing, what would your gig be? What do you think would bring you satisfaction if you weren't doing what you're doing now? Te- teaching history or art history. I thought that's what I wanted to do at one Well, don't point. you think you're doing it indirectly right now? You know? Yeah. No, for sure. But that I would I would have done it formerly. A lot of people, but I only came to this later in life. So people say, well, w- wouldn't it be serving you know public office? And the the fact of the matter is that I've said on many interviews many times that at whatever time this this career of mine enters a different phase, uh, you, you know, uh, I would like to run for public office. I talk about it all the time. Then privately, all of my advisors and my politician friends tell me, well, you can make as much influence not being in public office, but you know, doing what you do from the sidelines. I think you can make people think, So, uh, most certainly. We'll see. Um, and I think you've done a wonderful job of that. I mean, you make people think, they contemplate, they, they, put, they put themselves in the shoes of the people, because that's one of the things I think you're, I love in your storytelling. This is not, it sounds like I'm stroking you, I'm certainly not, but you putting someone who's sitting on their sofa drinking a beer as close as you can to being in the situation you're in. So there could be that kind of kind of uh, indirect experience, you know. And I think that that's – I think you can wield a lot more influence because I, I just think you can. I, I would I, – and I'm selfish. I don't want you to stop making your shows. So, <laughs> uh, But the last question I got for you, if you were to jump in your DeLorean, cruise back, you, you know, there's 16-year-old Andrew. You got a piece of advice, yep. wisdom – it could either get you on a better track in that moment or maybe to make life even better for 16-year-old you. But regardless, what is that piece of advice you're going to offer y- yourself at 16? Uh, the most important thing that I've learned in the last 45 years of my life is the following sentence. I don't know to the answer. I don't know the answer to that. Can you help me? I spent the first 30 years of my life, first 40 years of my life, so obsessed with self, so sure that I knew the answer to everything. And in in the last 20 years of my sobriety, and I've been sober 30 plus years, but it's really the last 20 years, I have learned the most valuable sentence in in, in my life is, I don't know, can you help me? I, I really like that. I think being able to ask questions... You have to kind of put your ego to the side, but when you talked about your history and substance abuse, the odds were not stacked in your favor at all. And I, again, I look at like Anthony Bourdain, no. the same thing. And I had a unique perspective because you know I grew up in Dallas as a kid and the latchkey kid in the eighties. There was a lot of high mm-hmm. roll in, you know. Let's say I was like, I definitely don't want that. It's life record, you know, that kind of a thing. Then I ended up working in radio and entertainment, and I found a lot of my favorite people had had a story arc where, yeah, they're a okay now, like a guy named Shadow Stevens. You remember what was it, American Top Forty? Oh, sure. You know, and I look at where they're at now, and there's there is so much wisdom, there's so much to be learned by somebody when you have seen, you know, bookends of what things could be like in life. And I I had an extra appreciation, uh, enhanced appreciation for those that could tell a story. Uh, about their recovery because I think they were some of the most wise people that I ever met. Uh, some of the best wisdom I've ever gotten has been through people that have been through it. You know, so I think that that's that's one of those things that I really have come to appreciate over the years. Is like I didn't have to take the ride, but I most certainly appreciate yours. You know, if that makes any sense. Hopefully, yep, absolutely. Um, oh, one last question before we go: What's going on with delis in America? I, I, is it my imagination, or everywhere I go, it's like there are less and less Jewish delis? There, there are, and the ones that are being opened are, are, are modernist takes on them. Some excellent. Some excellent. However, we, are, we have lost during COVID so many, and we continue to lose so many delis all the time, and they, are, they will be a thing of eras past. I you, mean, you the, think the so? Do you, th- that, do you really think like... Yeah, I, I, I think places like Katz's will hang on and, you know... Uh, you, you like know, the, the and Los handful Angeles of or... other, yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, that, that will still be there. Um, but we, we're losing a lot of those, those little delis around the country that, um, are exquisite. And I, I just think it's, they, they can't compete and people don't want to pay. 
They don't want to pay $30. Well, they don't want to pay $30 for a sandwich. And I'm not talking about, you know, overstuffed. It's just that the quality of the product has to be very, very high. And it takes just as much labor, if not more, to create that than, I mean, look, every these days with the restaurant economy and the economy in general being the way it is, every famous chef in the world wants to open a pizzeria. Why? It's the best food cost item that you can make. You know, and delis are not the best food food cost items you can make. Well, Andrew, again, uh, your generosity, your time. I so enjoyed this chat, and uh, I, I wish you nothing but the best next time you're in New Orleans. Uh, R&O's and then Dini's next door. You, you hit the local note right there. Double up. Lunch one, lunch two. It would be, definitely be on me. It would be my pleasure. But, my friend, uh, all the best to you, and looking forward to your uh, new show on is the Outdoor Channel. Yep, Wild Game Kitchen. Premieres September 19th at 9 o'clock Eastern. Family dinner, of course, uh, on Magnolia. Yep. Loving your stuff, my friend. Have yourself a killer rest of the day. Ho- hopefully this is another one of those great days for you. It, me too. Take it easy. And for you as well. Well, there you go. Andrew Zimmer. And that was that was a lot of fun. As I mentioned at the beginning of the show, uh, I didn't have anything to eat. So, you know, talking food for an hour with Andrew was, <laughs> it was fun, but man, I was hungry when I was done. Uh, really enjoyed the opportunity to sit down with him. The new shows, Magnolia Network, you can catch Family Dinner, as well as the show Wild Game Kitchen, which is on the Outdoor Channel. And of course, uh, the Netflix reboot of Iron Chef, you can check out Andrew as he's one of the judges. A gig I I've always wanted to have a judge on Iron Chef. That seems like it would be a lot of fun. Also got to throw a quick happy birthday to my son, Zachary, just turned 18. So, uh, so incredibly proud of him. Now I got two of those uh, adult type offspring. So that means that uh, two college kids, they're getting older. I somehow miraculously stay the same age. That's what I'm telling myself. All right, don't forget to subscribe and like the show on your favorite podcast app. A little review, if you would, Apple Podcasts or whatever app that you use. Of course, going to be back with another great episode soon with somebody very interesting. Just going to throw it out there. If you are a big uh, Ghostbusters fan, check out the next episode. Just a little tease, if you will. All right, that's it for me today. I'm going to run out and grab myself a bite to eat. You have a very safe and awesome rest of your day. We'll see you next time right here on Story and Craft. That's it for this episode of Story and Craft. Join Mark next week for more conversation right here on Story and Craft. Story and Craft is a presentation of Mark Preston Productions, LLC. Executive producer is Mark Preston. Associate producer is Zachary Holden. Please rate and review Story and Craft on Apple Podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. You can subscribe to show updates and stay in the know. Just head to storyandcraftpod.com and sign up for the newsletter. I'm Emma Dillon. See you next time. And remember, keep telling your story. Come on.